Now, I want to spend the rest of the time today working on details of the kinetic molecular theory. And this is sort of the kinetic molecular theory according to Gene Angel, all right? I am going to emphasize some things and maybe not talk about other things that I don't think are quite as important, all right? Now, um, the postulates of the kinetic molecular theory have been around a very long time. They're even older than I am. And so um, they are exceedingly well known and their effects are well known. And the first of the postulates that we need to recognize is that the gas molecules themselves are incredibly tiny, being made up of atoms, molecules, and so forth. They are tiny compared to the volume of the container. Right? So you could say, as I have here, that the volume of the, the molecules themselves, the aggregate volume, if you could look at every molecule, figure out its volume, add them all up, that volume you would get would be completely negligible compared to the volume occupied by the gas, uh, which is the volume of the container it's in. Now, the molecules of gas in that container are always moving uh, at any temperature above absolute zero. They are moving, and uh, they are moving randomly. They are moving constantly, and they're moving in a straight line unless they collide with something. Okay, I think there's a question about that on Omar. If they collide with something, they uh, do so with conservation of energy. That is to say, the energy of the particles after the collision, the net energy, kinetic energy, is exactly the same as the energy of the particles before. Between collisions, the molecules of ideal gas are assumed not to have any interaction with other molecules at all. Okay, ships that pass in the night, they don't affect one another, right? The collisions, as I mentioned, are assumed to be elastic, so the total kinetic energy of the aggregate particles doesn't change as long as you don't change the temperature. Now, one thing that's not obvious and that needs our attention is that these molecules, even though they have a certain average kinetic energy, have a range of speeds. Usually when uh, authors talk about the kinetic molecular theory, they use the symbol U for speed rather than V. Why? Not too sure. Probably have some reason for it. But your textbook uses U, so I've tried to move along with it. Now, um, even though they have a range of speed, what that means is if we take any sample, some proportion of the molecules are going relatively slowly, and some proportion of the molecules are going much more rapidly, and there is some average speed where most of the molecules are going, uh, and that we call that the most probable speed um, in the kinetic molecular theory, and we're going to assume that that's the same as the average speed to make life easy. As the temperature increases, if we let the temperature start to increase, the most probable or average speed also increases with it. And I'll show you some graphs that illustrate this in, in a moment. Um, now, keep in mind that even if the most probable speed increases, there's still a distribution of speeds. Some molecules going more slowly, some more in, going more rapidly, and many in the middle going near the average speed. So let's suppose we have some nitrogen gas. We have a little nitrogen gas in here. It's mixed with oxygen, but, uh, but nitrogen doesn't really care. Uh, if you had, if you focus on the nitrogen, and you apply the kinetic molecular theory at a level beyond what we'll do in this course, you'll find that at a particular temperature, let's say zero degrees Celsius, 273 kelvins, the average um, or most probable speed is something between 500 and 600 meters per second. That's fast, right? 
Well, I mean that's fast. The speed of sound under those conditions is 340 meters per second. So these nitrogen molecules at ice temperature are traveling significantly faster than the speed of sound. Now, if we had time, we could talk about how that enables the gas to propagate sounds so that when I talk, uh, people around me can hear. And when they talk, I can hear them. Uh, it has to do with the movement of the molecules, and the average speed is important in that consideration. If we increase the temperature to 1,273 Kelvin, in other words, we're going up 1,000 degrees Kelvin, the bluish green line, I guess that's aqua, isn't it? Uh, I don't know, but uh, it's not deep blue. That's deep blue down here. Uh, this one shows the most probable speed at just a little, right around 1,000 meters per second. So increasing the temperature 1,000 kelvins made the most probable speed increase from five or 600 up to 1,000. If you go up another 1,000 Kelvin, the blue, the dark blue line here looks like we have about 1,300 meters per second as the most probable speed. Also notice that the distribution gets wider as the temperature gets higher. It's sort of sharp over here at zero degrees Celsius. And then it gets a little wider and a little wider. So uh, the if we choose one molecule of the gas, this uh, nitrogen gas, we can write down an expression for that. If we take a snapshot of it, if we had a cell phone camera that could take uh, a picture of one nitrogen molecule uh, and measure its speed, um, the kinetic energy of that molecule at a given instant is one half the mass of the molecule, which we could calculate from the periodic table uh, times its speed squared, one half mv squared, the usual equation for kinetic energy. All right. Now, if we looked at the whole collection of nitrogen molecules, we have a large population. We would have to talk in terms of the average kinetic energy because, as we saw up here, the speed varies all over the place. So, uh, from from near zero to way up here, like a 3,000 meters per second. So we would use the, uh, this equation for the average kinetic energy, bar uh, capital E sub K is the kinetic energy, bar above it means the average kinetic energy for this population. And that's going to be equal to one half the mass of the individual molecules uh, times the speed squared bar, meaning the average of the squares of the molecular speeds. OK, well, that's mathematically a little bit complicated. But the thing that I want you to remember and take away from this slide is that as the mass changes for a particular type of gas, let's say we went from N2 to O2, the mass changed, the average kinetic energy will change as well. And the mind-boggling thing about this that I've always found was if you compare two gases with different masses at the same temperature, they will both have the same average kinetic energy. Whoa, what does that mean? Well, it means that the equation up here must have the same value for the two different gases, OK? The two different gases are going to have different masses, one larger, one smaller. And they're going to have different, dis uh, uh, different uh, average of squares velocity here. And the beautiful thing about this is that the two compensate for one another. Small molecules go faster. Larger molecules go slower. And they do so in the right way so that they both have the average, the same average kinetic energy. This is not intuitive. So you need to pull this into your mind right now 
and don't let it get away. It will play an important role in just a minute. All right? Slow molecules have larger mass. Fast molecules have smaller mass. I should really say it the other way. Well, let's look at some molecules here. Here's the distribution of uh, the speeds of hydrogen at a given temperature here. Molecular hydrogen. Okay, the molecular mass is two grams per mole. And these are the number of molecules with a given speed. So down in here somewhere, there is a peak. It's a way spread out thing here, but there's a peak which will be the most probable speed for hydrogen molecules, right? The most probable speed or the average speed will be at the top of this thing somewhere. So what will happen if we then take a molecule with a larger mass? What will happen to the average speed? It's going to decrease, right? It's going to have to decrease if the average kinetic energy is going to be the same. So we take helium, uh, the average speed molecular speed at the same temperature for helium with mass 4 is down here somewhere. Of course, there aren't any units, but you could see that it's a lower average molecular speed than hydrogen has here. So this is what I'm getting at. If we take it one more to water vapor, 18, the average speed is down here, and the mass went up to 18. So as the mass gets larger, the molecular speed gets smaller so that the average kinetic energy of these gases is the same as long as the temperature is the same. That is the most important aspect, in my opinion, of the kinetic molecular theory. Okay, N2, O2, so forth. So molecules with higher masses have lower average speed. And the conclusion of this that you need to take uh, out of here with you today is that oxygen has a higher mass, it has a lower average speed, and helium has a lower mass and a higher average speed, such that both of them have the same kinetic energy, and if they run up against the wall and bounce off the wall, one of them's going faster on the average, but it has a smaller mass, so the kinetic energy of the collision, the change in kinetic energy of the collision is smaller. Uh, uh, well, no, it's the same. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Higher mass, lower speed, or lower mass, higher speed, the energy of the collision is the same, and the energy of the collision determines the pressure. So here is my statement. The situation with two gases with different masses will be such that the average speed of the two will make the average kinetic energy the same and they will produce the same pressure under the same set of conditions. Okay, now there are several upshots of this. One thing I want to talk about is a um, uh, dependence, is the dependence of the average speed on the mass, okay? You know, mass goes up, speed goes down, vice versa. Uh, there is a phenomenon called effusion of a gas, where a gas in a container with a small hole, gradually uh, some of the gas escapes. And I'm going to show you this little video. Let me see if I can get the sound to come up here. Wake up up there. Uh, and what we have in this video is a little manometer right here. It's hooked up to a cork with a, a uh, glass tube in it. And what's going to happen is the person conducting the experiment is going to uh, use this. Uh, this is called a permeable cup. It's unglazed porcelain. Gases can effuse through it slowly. It has lots and lots of tiny holes. So you're going to look at what happens when they fill this cup with different gases compared to air. Normally, if we just put this cup 
on that uh, uh, rubber stopper, nothing would happen, right? Why? Because there's air inside, fusing out at whatever that speed is for air, and there's air outside fusing in at the same rate, so nothing happens. But what if they put a different gas inside of here? Then you have the gas on the inside, he's coming out according to what his mass is. The lower the mass, the faster. And we have the gas on the outside, it's always the same, that's the air. All right, let's see what happens here. Graham's law describes this and it says the rate of effusion of a gas is inversely proportional to the square root of its molar mass. Rate of effusion inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. So here we go. Helium gas molecules have small mass and diffuse more rapidly into the porous cup than air molecules effuse out. This generates a higher pressure inside the cup. Methane gas molecules are heavier than helium, but lighter than air, so they effuse through the cup more slowly than helium. Methane effusion generates a slight increase in pressure within the cup. Methane's lighter, goes in faster than the air comes out. Carbon dioxide molecules are significantly heavier than air, so their effusion rate into the cup is much less than the effusion rate of air out of the cup. How come they turn the beaker right side up this time? What's the density of carbon dioxide compared to air, greater or less? It's greater, so the beaker has to be uh, uh, kept so the carbon dioxide will stay there. Gonna, have a minute here, we're gonna do this again. Helium gas molecules have small mass and diffuse more rapidly into the porous cup than air molecules effuse out. So the helium is kept in a beaker that's upside down, right? So the density of the helium is less than air. If you turned it over, what would happen? Gone. So you keep it upside down. This generates a higher pressure inside the cup. Methane gas molecules are heavier than helium, but lighter than air. So they effuse through the cup more slowly than helium. Methane effusion generates a slight increase in pressure within the cup. We had been discussing Graham's law of effusion, and I want to continue that today. Uh, we saw a little video about the rates at which gas is effused through a porous cup, and our conclusion was that lighter gas molecules effuse faster because their speed on average is higher. The higher the speed of the molecules, the more often they bounce around on the wall and then more often they hit the hole where they go out through the wall into the outside world. So um, the kinetic molecular theory ends up giving us this relationship. The rate of infusion is proportional to one over the square root of the molar mass, or it's the rate of infusion is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. This is one way to state Graham's law of effusion. Now, Graham's law can be used to measure the molar mass of unknown gases. And it works um, quite well if you have the necessary uh, equipment to measure it. And we will have, we will encounter two kinds of problems on Graham's law, both of which have to do with uh, in almost every case, measuring the molar mass of an unknown gas. And uh, the first one of these is based on the effusion rate of an unknown gas X being determined relative to that of a known gas, say helium. So uh, if you look at the ratio of the rates, rate of the unknown gas divided by the rate of helium, 
since they are inversely proportioned to the molar masses, then the ratio of the rates is equal to the square root of the molar mass of helium. Notice it's up here, and the rate's down here. That's the inverse proportion. Uh, divided by the square root of the molar mass of x. So if you were to solve this for the molar mass of x, it would be uh, the molar mass of helium, which you read off the table, times uh, the uh, rate of helium squared over the rate of x squared. You square both sides and get rid of those nasty square root signs, in case your calculator doesn't have a square root, uh, or in case you don't know how to use it. Uh, square both sides of the equation and then solve for m sub x. So that's one way, the ratio of rates. Uh, since, oh, by the way, the units are things like liters per minute, moles per second, that kind of thing. That's what the rate units would look like. The number, uh, something related to the number of gas particles that effuse in a, in a given time period. The other thing is the time of effusion is proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the rate. The faster the rate, the shorter the time. Okay, the, the higher the rate, the lower the time that it takes. Uh, so we can, when we put this in the context of the rate equation, then the time of x is proportional to the square root of the molar mass of x. Now, uh, the units that are involved in this, of course, are just time units. So this would be seconds, minutes, um, hours, and so forth. So if you encounter a problem where the data comes to you in terms of the time that it takes for a gas, a certain amount of gas to effuse, uh, then you would use a, um, an equation based on time. And uh, that, that equation would look something like this, the time of x divided by the time of, let's say, helium, a known gas, uh, is equal to the square root of the molar mass of x divided by the square root of the molar mass of helium. Now notice the difference here. Uh, there are two different equations. If you use the wrong one, you're going to get the wrong answer, but it's going to be one of the choices, most likely. So um, be sure, if you're using time, that it's straight across. That is to say, there's a direct relationship between the time of the fusion for a particular gas and the square root of its molar mass. OK, uh, so keep in, keep in mind the differences that are, that are there. Well, let's do an, uh, an example, example problem. A sample of argon effusions, effuses out a pinhole in 77.3 seconds. Note, it's not a rate. It's time. It takes that long. An equal amount of unknown gas Q requires 97.6 seconds under the same conditions. Calculate the molar mass of, of Q. So we're going to use the, the time equation, of course, the, uh, the time of Q. Over the time of argon. equals the ratio of the square root of the molar mass of Q divided by the square root of the molar mass of argon. That's the time equation, right? So um, if we uh, write down our data here, the time of argon uh, is 77.3 seconds, and the molar mass of argon is 39.95 grams per mole, according to the periodic table. Uh, then the time of unknown gas Q is 97.6 seconds. And we don't know what the molar mass of Q is. That's what we want to solve for. All right. so. Um, if we put in the values here, and let's go ahead and square both sides of this. So time squared of Q, of Q 
cubed divided by time squared of argon is equal to the molar mass of Q divided by the molar mass of argon. So if we solve... No, that's for rate. This is time. This is time, seconds. If, you were, if, if it gave you rate, you'd be right. But it doesn't in this case. You have to watch to see which one it is. Okay, so the time squared of Q uh, is, Q is 97.6 seconds squared divided by the time squared of argon, 77.3 seconds squared is equal to the ratio of the molar mass of Q, whatever that might be, over 39.95 grams per mole. And when I solve this, um, M of Q is equal to 39.95 grams per mole times 97.6 seconds squared divided by 77.3 seconds squared. And the molar mass of Q turned out to be 63.7 grams of Q per mole. Okay? To fill your tires up with pure nitrogen. Anybody seen that? There used to be a lot of them around, but uh, I think the word's getting out. Probably from my students, I hope, uh, about this. For 5 to $10 a tire, for example, Costco will do this for you. <coughs> They will fill your tires up with pure nitrogen gas. And they and some other people make claims about what that'll do for you. Uh, that it's a whole lot better than air. So I want you to use kinetic molecular theory and help me here figure out which of these claims are bogus. First claim, your tire pressure won't rise and fall with temperature. Tire pressure won't rise and fall with temperature change. Now, nitrogen is pretty close to an ideal gas. So what do you think the chances are that it will stop changing its, its pressure given that a tire's volume is basically constant and the number of moles is basically constant? You think the tire pressure won't change with temperature change? It will. It definitely will because the N2 molecules will be moving faster and they'll hit the wall more frequently and maybe harder uh, on the average and therefore the pressure is going to go up. So this is false. Just mark a big F beside that. It's completely false, meant to trip, trip up people who never had freshman chemistry. Nitrogen leaks out more slowly than air. This is touted to be one of the important things. Uh, does it? Well, uh, the molar mass of N2 is 28. The molar mass average on air is somewhere between 29 and 30. Let's just call it 29. Okay, uh, grams per mole, both cases. So which one of these is going to effuse more rapidly? The nitrogen. The lower molar mass means it will effuse more rapidly, meaning it's going to leak out faster. Your 5 or $10 is going to be used up even faster. Okay, uh, So it actually, nitrogen leaks out more rapidly than it. Oh, too bogus. Yes, go ahead. Now, do they actually say air or do they say oxygen? No, they say air because you wouldn't have pure oxygen in your tire, would you? Well, right, but that could just be then making a true statement that's false in the real world. Well, the, um, the ads that I saw said air. And I also saw uh, one of these uh, experts, uh, car expert saying 
that this was a wonderful thing and we should all consider doing it. Uh, and I concluded that maybe he hadn't taken freshman chemistry either, or at least he didn't know much about the kinetic molecular theory. But there are some things that are accurate. Nitrogen doesn't promote corrosion of tire rims like air does. Well, I have to agree with that. Air contains oxygen and most likely the rim, if it's going to corrode, will corrode because of the action of oxygen, right? Uh, I got to thinking back, I've been driving a lot of years, and I don't ever remember having a corroded rim. Maybe on the outside, but not in where the, uh, inside the tire. But maybe it is, maybe it is, I don't know. Smoother ride and less rolling resistance. You think, it's kind of hard to tell what, what accounts for a smoother ride, but I would assume it's the properties of the ideal gas. Uh, and so I would argue that nitrogen is at least as good an ideal gas as the air mixture. So I wouldn't expect there to be any, uh, uh, this, any difference here measured objectively, at least. Okay, and finally, nitrogen doesn't cause dry rot of the rubber in the tires. Well, I don't know much about dry rot, but I think oxygen probably causes it. Uh, I could be all wrong on that. If somebody knows what causes dry rot, speak up. Uh, but I don't think, nitrogen is so unreactive, I do not see how it could cause any kind of rot in tires. Uh, but oxygen, yeah. It could. So I would have to go with this one as probably being accurate, and uh, the corrosion is probably being accurate, and the other three bogus, according to Gene. Okay? Yes, go ahead. Uh, it's a weighted average of 79% uh, uh, N2, 21% O2 and 1% roughly carbon dioxide. Do we know that number? If you if you have this on the homework, you'll have to go and look it up on uh, the, the section of the chapter five that talks about air, gives you the breakdown, and so you can calculate the weighted average. I don't know that it's tabulated anywhere in our book. 